Disclaimer, this video touches on or discusses the topics listed here. If you find any of these distressing, I would suggest you stop watching now. Hey y'all, David here, welcome back. I've got something rather unusual to share with all of you today. This story is a lot. I'm going to try and cover as much of it as I can, but God knows I won't be able to. But before we get started, I want to just give you all a heads up. This isn't some like petty yet interesting bit of internet drama which we can all learn about and laugh about. This is a very fascinating piece of internet history and I want to acknowledge that, but it is also an extremely messed up one. It's a story that spans nearly a decade of time, multiple fandoms. It's about conventions, cults, conspiracy theories, and above all, the amount of harm just a single person can do the people he surrounds himself with. This is the story of Andy Blake, a liar, a manipulator, and above all, one of the most abusive people in fandom history. Part 1. The Cult of Bag End. Our journey begins in 2001 with The Lord of the Rings and its fandom. The Peter Jackson movies had just been released, so interest in Tolkien and Middle Earth and all of that was at an all-time high. As I'm sure you can imagine, there were a lot of online communities devoted to his work and the movies and all of that. Our focus, however, is on one particular fan, Victoria Bitters. Victoria, at this time, was a very active member in the Lord of the Rings fandom, drawing fan art and writing fan fiction. And Victoria was finding a lot of positive feedback online from other fans. In particular, one other fan named Abby became an ecstatic follower of Victoria's work. Victoria Bitters' activities weren't just focused on fan fiction for long, though. Eventually, they created a Yahoo group titled Bit of Earth. Bit of Earth was a fan group devoted specifically to Samwise Gamgee and Samwise Gamgee specifically. And it was super popular. So popular, in fact, it became a website into its own right at some point or another. Abby naturally followed Victoria to this website, and the two began communicating more frequently and began to become friends. So a bit of context here. You may be wondering, why am I talking about someone named Victoria Bitters? So Victoria Bitters is the subject of our video. The person we're talking about today is a trans man. Obviously his actions don't reflect what most trans people are like, to say the least. I hope I don't have to make that clear. Victoria Bitters was just his pseudonym, which he was using at the time, and after checking with a few trans friends of mine, general consensus was that it was fine to use it since it wasn't his actual dead name. So with that in mind, moving forward, a few months into their friendship, Victoria revealed something to Abby, something he'd been kind of hinting at for a while leading up to this point. Victoria claimed that he had the ability to channel, and not just to channel ghosts or spirits or whatever, no. Victoria claimed that he could channel the Lord of the Rings actors. So Abby has written at length about this point in her life, and we can get a better understanding of why she was so open to an idea like this. She was, at this point, a recovering Christian. She had a lot of religious trauma from her teen years, and she was practicing paganism, but it really wasn't doing much for her. Long story short, she was vulnerable, and there was an emotional need in her life which was not being filled at that time. To quote from one of her blog posts, This tepid paganism got me through until I had real problems in my life. I was spiraling into some pretty catastrophic depression. My marriage was empty and unsatisfying. My job as a receptionist was isolating and unchallenging, and I was very lonely socially now that my best friend had moved out. I still had a few local friends, but I was just not doing well. I should have gone to a therapist, but instead I got online to fill the hours. With this in mind, I'm not totally surprised that Abby was open to a lot of the stuff that Victoria was sharing with her, and the discussions between the two would oftentimes last late into the night. And I can imagine that staying up super late would tire someone out and might make them more open to some slightly more out there ideas. It's also worth noting at this point that Abby wrote about how when she was writing fan fiction, she sometimes felt like she was channeling the characters. I can only assume that that belief was encouraged by Victoria as well, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Things started to get even weirder at this point. Victoria Bitters began to talk about not just channeling actors, but the characters. In particular, he talked about how he could channel Samwise Gamgee quite frequently. These claims would then escalate to become even bolder than that. My master, that is to say, Sam, 
says that some of the creatures of Middle-earth, elves, dragons, dwarves, existed much as described as beings other than man long ago because there are artifacts found beyond the capability of the cultures they are found in, and there are just too damn many myths from tribes that never knew each other, countries that never collided that are all the same. Another quote from this time. My master says that the surge of interest in Tolkien's Middle-earth has created a huge explosion of creational energy not only through the fans, but through the thousands of deeply devoted people in the production itself. The real star spirits and tree spirits are reacting to it, reaching out in return. In our case, they reach out to us through the most closely identified aspects we have. Hobbits. I'm a little unclear on the beliefs here, I have to be honest, but to the best of my understanding, Victoria would claim that... Tol Victoria would claim that Tolkien was enlightened to write the books about Middle-earth, much like prophets in the past were enlightened to write their own holy texts. A lot of, like, the mythos he himself created was just Victoria renaming already existing deities and just kind of slapping a Lord of the Rings paint onto it, that sort of thing. And Abby wasn't the only one who was getting sucked into this, no. Not at all. Several others were getting entrapped in this belief system as well, all being told similar stories about Victoria and their ability to channel. Abby's relationship with her husband continued to struggle as her relationship with Victoria continued to grow. It culminated in a trip where Abby flew out to Victoria, who channeled for Abby in person. Victoria on this trip would introduce the concept of others, which was the name that he gave to the people who he supposedly channeled during these sessions. Eventually, Victoria moved in with Abby and her husband, another blow to their marriage, which would very soon dissolve after this, and then visits to other members of their little group began to follow. On one such visit to a group member named Little Sam, Abby has described seeing what at the time she thought was a miracle, Victoria making a river run backwards. One of the nights we were there, we went for a late night walk. We walked to a small curve in the river. It was very dark and the moon was very bright, and we were getting a big secret about our destiny from an elf, from Lord Elrond to be precise. It was a demonstration to prove to Little Sam that she was beloved by Ulmo, the Valar who was in charge of water, and I think we just willed ourselves to see the ripples moving backwards. It's not that hard to do. It's a fairly basic optical illusion. And then it wasn't just long distance visits. No, eventually Victoria and Abby moved in together and other group members followed. They called themselves the Bagenders, a fellowship of Lord of the Rings fans, if you will, running bit of earth and practicing Victoria's twisted religious vision behind closed doors. Life in the house was pretty awful. I want to make something very clear. As strange as the beliefs here are, Victoria Bitters was a monster, plain and simple. To put it simply, once they were all under the same roof, it was a lot easier for Victoria to manipulate them, to essentially brainwash them. He never worked, he constantly mooched off of everyone else in the house, he had a habit of playing members against one another, lying to them. He had a habit of using the others that he channeled to further manipulate them. Eventually, everyone else in the house began to live in fear of him and the people he channeled. Soon after they all moved in together, Victoria posted to their live journal saying that they were going to be taking a step back from fandom, which was not true, by the way. They'd already started operating on Bit of Earth under a new account, with a male name, and around this point in real life, something very notable happened as well. Victoria revealed something to the group. He claimed that Victoria Bitters' soul had left his body, and it had been replaced by the twin soul of Elijah Woods. He began to go by the name Jordan Wood, which is what I'll be calling him moving forward. On top of this, he, alongside Abby, began to tell people that Victoria Bitters had died, and that Jordan Wood was someone else entirely. But Bit of Earth and his group of worshippers was not enough for Jordan. He had other plans. Jordan would post to Bit of Earth about a fan charity project he had in mind that he wanted everyone else to get on board with. This project, named Project Eleanor, was heavily promoted on Bit of Earth, and it was a project which initially was meant to build a garden in a Portland, Oregon library. Funding would be an ongoing effort to make this happen on the website. Amazingly, Jordan approached Sean Astin from the Lord of the Rings movies 
to come and take part in construction. And believe it or not, Sean Astin agreed to do this. Jordan claimed that this garden would be planned by a master gardener who lived in the area, but that was a lie. The master gardener who was planning the garden was Jordan himself, just channeling Sam again and claiming that it was someone else. As a part of fundraising for this, the Bagenders organized the Lime Party. The Lime Party was a screening event. They showed the animated Hobbit and the animated Lord of the Rings. There was raffles, there was karaoke. Interestingly enough, at this event, Jordan and Abby appeared dressed as hobbits. They had Jordan's hair glued to their feet, and that's not all. They also claimed that the hair that was glued to their feet was from a friend who had recently died presumably because the hair was Jordan's. They were talking about Victoria Bitters. Wow, just wow. So this is the Regal Cinema at the Lloyd Center. This is where the line party took place. It's the weekend and there are some people inside. I just turned around after filming that and there was a woman walking right behind me. She must've heard all that <laughs> and more people are coming, but it's weird to think that that move away from the traffic that Jordan could have stood right where I'm standing right now. He and Abby and all the other members of the fellowship and whoever else attended the Lime Party were here. That happened here. Just kind of crazy, you know? Overall, it seems like the Lime Party was a success, which is good because plans for Project Eleanor were not going well. There was a change of location for the garden. No longer was it going to be at a Portland library. It was now going to be at the Riggs Institute for Literacy, a reading charity which operated near the library which they initially planned the garden for. A volunteer who was meant to collect plants from a variety of garden centers in the area got their instructions very late into the game and was unable to get everything that was required on time. Jordan also claimed that the person who was going to provide lumber for the project had backed out. And that is when another notable individual in this story comes into play. Turamel. Turamel was a bit older than the Bagenders, but had developed a bit of a friendship before this point. She'd offered to design like a beautiful carved sculpture of a book for this garden. Very cool. Jordan, for whatever reason, specifically asked her to cover the costs for the lumber now that supposedly it hadn't been paid for. And she did. Seemingly out of pocket. The night before construction, Sean Aston and his family flew in and attended a screening of The Two Towers. Proceeds for this event were meant to go towards a different reading charity, Reading is Fundamental, but that was not going to pass, unfortunately. Funding for Project Eleanor had not gone to plan, and so that money went towards supplies for construction the following day instead. To quote Abby again, we had the screening of The Two Towers the night before, where I stood in front of the whole theater and said we'd raised $3,000 and that all the proceeds would go to reading as fundamental. I know I said proceeds because even before the screening, I knew we were in the red for the garden. The money wasn't where the lies were. It was the people, the humble retired gardener that planned the garden. That was the real Samwise Gamgee as channeled by Jordan. The interview questions written by Elijah Wood, again, just Jordan. The frantic hidden conversations with Jordan's various characters. We were the lie, not the project. Construction day was also something of a shit show, it seems. It was horribly disorganized. To me, at least, though, the biggest thing to note is what Jordan did on this day. You'd think, as, you know, the, the one spearheading this, that he would jump in full of gusto, just getting down in the dirt to get this project underway. But nope, not at all. Jordan appeared that day at the construction site wearing a cast. He claimed he'd broken his hand the night before, and this was just completely not true. The cast was in fact homemade and had been put together by Jordan himself after he channeled an elvish healer. To make it worse, volunteers were unable to complete the project on time and had to return the following day to get it all done. Sean Astin, as I'm sure you can imagine, was none too pleased about this, but they did manage to complete the garden. So I am now leaving the Lloyd Center. I am taking the train. Uh, I got a bit of a nice surprise for you guys coming up. It's just gonna take a while to get there. Fortunately, because there were gardeners working in the garden, I wasn't able to talk during any of that. 
Yeah, it looks like it's still there. I didn't see any kind of like carved stone book or anything like that from the little glance I got, but that was it. That was the garden that they built. It, it's still there. I imagine it's changed quite a bit over the years. I don't quite know what it looked like before Project Eleanor went underway, but that's where that reading charity was based. It's now a Catholic bookstore. It's just kind of crazy that Jordan and Abby and everyone else just were there, you know? They were there. They helped build that. Project Eleanor may have been a mess behind the scenes, but it had been well received by the fandom as a whole. And as such, the fact that it had gone poorly was not enough to stop Jordan. Soon after this, Tent Moot 2003 was announced. This was going to be a full-on Lord of the Rings convention, and things got a whole lot worse. Hey, editing David here. I filmed the next section of this on a different day at a friend's house, and I just kind of wanted to apologize for the lens flares you see on the camera. The flares disappear after about 10 minutes. This won't happen again. I hope it's not too distracting. Just really sorry about that. The fellowship at this point decided to move to LA, but the convention was still going to be held in Oregon, which seems like a logistical nightmare to me, but honestly, I doubt this would have gone any better if they hadn't backstayed in Portland. So full disclosure, this is where the timeline gets kind of messy and real life got in the way of me being able to do a really thorough deep dive on this like I wanted to, but I can give you the rundown to the best of my ability. Tent Moot on paper sounded relatively straightforward. It was a Lord of the Rings fan convention with a lot of people involved in the film was flying into Oregon to do meet and greets and sign photos and probably do panels or whatever. Each individual member of Bit of Earth had their own job in organizing, but all you need to know is that money for Tentment was tight and nothing went according to plan during any of this. Jordan emailed Air New Zealand asking for free airfares for actors, claiming that Bit of Earth was a non-profit, which it wasn't. He also claimed that proceeds from Tentment would go to reading as fundamental. This fact would come to bite them in the ass later. I have to be honest, I don't understand Jordan's thinking here at all. I don't know why an airline would just do that and provide free airfare like that. I think Jordan just assumed they'd roll over because it was a charity and be a good cause or whatever. In any case, it fell through, and Jordan informed Abby of this when things were coming down to the wire with the deadline for them leaving to Oregon just days away. Other aspects of planning were already going poorly as well. Ticket sales had been struggling. Jordan's solution to this was to rope Toramel into helping at this point, spitting a story about how New Zealand had become such a popular tourist destination because of the movies that Air New Zealand was no longer able to donate the tickets that were needed. This is a very simplified version of what went down, but he essentially pressured Toramel into spending thousands of dollars to cover airfare, but they still needed more money to pay for stuff. And as such, Jordan pressured Abby into calling basically everyone they knew asking for help, something she did not want to do and which I don't blame her for. That sounds horrifying. I am embarrassed on her behalf. To quote Abby again, I am sorry that my memories of that afternoon and the next day are not clear because that doesn't help things. I do remember that he stopped me at some point, smiling victoriously. He told me Janine, that's Toramel, had volunteered her own card and paid for $1,500 in airfare. It wouldn't get everyone there. And guess who got to handle canceling people's appearances? That was also not fun at all, but it would allow the convention to happen. I was horrified. I could not believe that Janine had done that. One of the few things I do remember was begging Jordan to stop her from charging it herself. I had a seriously bad gut feeling about the whole thing, but again, my concerns were irrelevant to him. Everything was going along fine now, according to Jordan. We had become friendly with our neighbors, and because our apartment was a crazed mess of packing and preparations, I went next door to take a nap before that long drive. The neighbors had left earlier in the week. Suffice to say, tensions were running high, and unbeknownst to the Enders and many of the volunteers who were going to provide their time, Jordan had been lying about so much more than that. There was no way in hell this convention was going to happen, and it seems like he knew that in the next day or two his deception was going to be revealed. Because that night, Abby was awoken by a panicked Diamond and Little Sam. Jordan had locked himself in the bathroom and had taken a lot of pills. They'd pried the door open with a screwdriver. That was when I got there. And there on the floor was Jordan, apparently unconscious, next to a pool of vomit that was mostly made up of pills. There was a note. It said that Janine had canceled the airline tickets, Tent Mood had fallen apart, and he was sorry. Someone had already called 911. I was beyond destroyed. Jordan wasn't actually in any serious danger. Nothing in the bathroom could have seriously hurt him. The pills he took just made him extremely sick. 
but it did mean that he got to avoid consequences for his actions. At this point, Toromel was emailing basically everyone involved in this convention, interrogating them, and word had spread to volunteers and ticket holders. With Jordan in the hospital, it was down to the rest of the group to deal with the fallout. Once it became clear that airfares weren't being paid for, Abby did try and contact guests to implore them to not come, but not everyone got the message in time. Abby would very quickly receive a call the next day. So a bit of context here, the plan was for actors to fly into LAX and then to fly out to Portland from there. But unfortunately, because of the flights that Toramel canceled, three actors from the film, Jed Brophy, Paul Randall, and Brian Sergent, made it to LA and their Portland flights were canceled. They were the only three who did not get the message that there was going to be no convention. They were just kind of stranded there in Los Angeles. Keep in mind, the flight from New Zealand to Los Angeles is probably really long. Imagine getting off of that extremely exhausting flight only to find out that your flight is canceled and there, there's nowhere for you to go. Brian Surgent had family who lived in LA, so he ended up staying with them, but for whatever reason, the other two did not go with him. With the actors unable to pay for a hotel and the bag enders unable to pay for accommodation themselves, they had no choice but to take them in back to their apartment. And if that wasn't humiliating enough, when they got back to that apartment, they discovered something. By this point, Jordan had gotten out of the hospital, and I guess he had quite a bit of time to himself while the rest of them were at the airport. In addition to this, somewhere along the way leading up to this, during the planning for Tent Moot, a member had left the group on bad terms. Before the actors arrived, Jordan trashed one of the apartment's bedrooms, pissing all over the bed and making it completely unusable, and he then claimed that that former member was responsible. I can only imagine the smell. This also meant that the bag enders had to sleep on the floor, giving the actors their beds. Just awful. Just awful all around. This weekend sounds like it was the worst social gathering ever. Members took the two of them sightseeing and eventually they left. But just because they'd gotten through that weekend does not mean they were in the clear. The fandom had gotten word of what had happened, and to put it mildly, they were none too pleased. To make matters worse, Turamel was furious about being charged for the flights and was still emailing them, insisting on being paid, and was continuing to interrogate basically anyone involved about what was going on with Tent Moot. In attempting to organize this convention, Jordan built a convoluted house of cards and they were all falling down around him. And Turamel was picking through its remains. I don't blame Turamel for being angry. She was made to pay thousands of dollars in airfare, but her behavior after this point is frankly heinous. She threatened to go to some members' workplaces to stalk them if she wasn't going to get paid ASAP, gleefully stalked them for years afterwards and talked about them openly online. And it made it a lot harder for Abby, and I imagine a lot of the others as well, to leave because she was constantly vilifying them to the community and the fandom and the internet as a whole. Yes, they did lie to help Jordan, but that was because they felt pressured to do so. Even after Toromel discovered that Jordan was running a cult out of his apartment, she basically blamed all of them. She would also go on to write an, a book about this experience titled When the Fan Hits the Shit. I do have the book here. I did buy it for research purposes. I really struggled to get through this. Supposedly some of the information in here is inaccurate, but that's not my main problem. My problem with the book is that it's just got this really nasty tone. It's like gleefully malicious about its subject matters, especially about the fact that Jordan is trans, like that's somehow a literal representation or reflection of his deceptions. It uses his real legal dead name throughout, and it's just unpleasant. I understand that Toromel was seriously financially hurt by the lies here, and she has every right to be angry and to tell other people about what happened. The book just feels vindictive and gross, and I, I hate it. I read what little I needed to to get the information about the convention, and then I didn't read any more. Tormel's choices here are just awful. Like, she emailed Jordan's parents to get more information about him. Just, just awful stuff overall. And then she just bragged about all this terrible stuff she did in the book. Do I think Tent Moot was an intentional scam? No. There are lots of stories about poorly managed and poorly planned fan conventions from over the years, which were handled by immature and non-professional individuals, and I think this is just another example of that. Jordan just liked the attention that fan events gave him, but he didn't actually have the work ethic or knowledge to actually make them go according to plan. I imagine him liking the attention is why every single one of these events was framed as a charity event of some kind or another. He could get the acolytes for doing good work, and also get his ego stroked by having people come to a thing he planned. To me, the term scam implies an intent to 
steal money from people, knowingly giving them something bad or misleading. I don't think that that's what Jordan intended to do here. In any case, it wasn't just social ostracization from the fandom that plagued the group. Not long after this, Jordan was arrested in Portland, Oregon, and after that arrest, he and Abby were banned from soliciting money for charity in the state of Oregon. And with that, the fellowship, or well, the cult, let's call it what it is, just kind of slowly disbanded. With Jordan's lies having come to light, Bit of Earth as a website was over. Little Sam would leave and go back to live with her family. A latecomer to the group named Diamond would leave eventually sometime after that. And then only one member remained, Abby. She was alone with Jordan. By this point, Jordan had convinced Abby that she'd been abused by her family, that she'd somehow repressed these memories, and Jordan was the only one who was able to help her remember them. As such, she'd cut ties with them and the rest of her old social circle. She was dependent on him. The two of them would eventually begin to work as costume performers on Hollywood Boulevard to make ends meet as finances were tight. And this was when Jordan's pantheon of others began to expand. He began at first by channeling characters from Narnia before moving on to completely original characters of his own invention. These original characters were teen soldiers fighting in an alternate universe, fighting in an alternate version of World War II. He also claimed that Elijah Wood's soul had left his body and it was now replaced by Orlando Bloom's. That coincided with him changing his name to Andy Blake, which is what I'll be referring to him as moving forward. Freed now from the confines of just fictional characters in canon, Andy's lore began to grow more and more convoluted, becoming increasingly conspiratorial in nature. He began talking of men in black types and secret federal prisons, all that kind of stuff. And he also claimed that these secretive government types were out to get the both of them. And it got to a point where he decided that the threat was so bad, they needed to escape to Canada. Not by emigrating normally, no. That would be too risky, potentially allowing them to be tracked. No, they were going to cross the border illegally on foot. Now, that sounds risky, doesn't it? But Abby was reassured by a mountaineer, channeled by Andy, of course, who informed her that they'd make it across easily. They told everyone they knew they were moving to New York to open a cafe. Once they got to New York, they hopped onto a train, got off the train, and tried to cross the border on foot. Unsurprisingly, they were immediately caught by Border Patrol. Andy attempted to explain his intentions and Border Patrol laughed in their faces. And in response to that, Andy lashed out. He started screaming and tearing at his hair, shrieking like the crazy person he really is. He wailed and cried and I was left to be the only adult handling the situation. And I couldn't. When I was interviewed by the immigration agent, I couldn't even explain why we were there. I had no answers. Abby was eventually able to take some initiative. She had an idea of what to do. She decided to contact her mother. As already stated, they'd not spoken for several years, but this was the only real option. They had hardly anything saved and nowhere to go. <laughs> Abby's mom deserves mother of the year for every year, just ever. Unbeknownst to Abby, she'd been keeping an eye on them, sometimes flying down to LA to make sure they were okay whilst working on Hollywood Boulevard. She'd also been saving up money for if or when her daughter ever reached out. She had also contacted Andy's parents to make sure they were in the loop. Abby's mom took them to a hotel and made an offer they couldn't refuse. She'd give them money to start living in an apartment in Virginia on the condition that Abby spend a month back at home with her and would go to a therapist. And he would spend that month living with his parents during this period, and the two would be separated. Without much of a choice, the two of them agreed. I get the impression Andy was a lot less happy about this arrangement than Abby was, which is not too much of a surprise if we're being honest here. Since I was only going to be there for a month, I was seeing a therapist two or three times a week. This seemed reasonable enough. I was as honest with the therapist as I dared to be which meant I was actually lying a lot. It sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it really isn't. I told him as much about my life as possible, but I couldn't tell him how many of the people I told him about were others that I only spoke to through my partner. He worked with me on my anxiety, which I admitted was crippling at that point, and helped me start to trust my mother again. I was starting to see that I had gotten carried away with my memories, that they weren't completely accurate after all. I was facing the fears that had kept me prisoner, even as I defended my prison. Abby began to dread the nightly phone calls she'd have with Andy. I don't think she really realized how unhappy he'd made her until there was distance. Andy, for his part, kept sending her messages from people he channeled and was otherwise just super miserable at his parents' house for this entire time. The visit with her mother went on for a bit longer than anticipated. She even got to go on a trip to New York City with her, something which she loved. And all the while, the looming return to Andy was on the horizon. 
something she realized that she was dreading even more by the day. It got to a point where she realized she couldn't do it. There was no way she could return. The lies, the trauma, the fear. I imagine the thought of going back to that environment was just too much to contemplate. We met him at his parents' house. My mother had called them so they would be prepared for what was coming. Part of the conversation was in private, where there was a brief, brutal onslaught of others, pleading, condemning, cursing, crying. I couldn't be alone with him any longer. I came out to where our parents were. I told him I just couldn't. He kept asking me, you can't what? Over and over, trying every possible way to get a reason he could construct or a person to blame. I couldn't. He became more and more heated. I remember all our parents moving as one, his to stand on either side of him as my mother took my arm. I needed her to help me walk away. I could not turn from his pleading eyes. She guided me to the car as Jordan began to scream, that same hideous, chilling, keening wail that he terrorized all of us with in the cult, now no longer the howl of some supernatural anguish, but that of a thwarted and monstrous child. I got into the car and mom drove us the hell away from there. And thus, the first cult Andy ever built and Abby's time with him came to an end. So much has been written about this. It is one of the most infamous stories ever and it just feels unreal. But I do feel like the focus is often on what a disaster tent moot was and not everything surrounding that. Andy didn't just try to organize a convention that went poorly, he did so much more and basically all of it was a lot worse than that. Tent moot is just the thing that had the most public fallout in its aftermath. Andy would remain offline for quite some time, he lived with his parents for a bit, and while he'd been caught that isn't where our story ends. Andy Blake would resurface in an entirely different fandom under a brand new username. Part two, the order of the fanfic. So here I am again, talking about this goddamn franchise and it's unbelievably cringy fandom. We're gonna jump from 2007 where we left things to 2008 and Andy now using the name fanfiction online is beginning to get quite involved in the Harry Potter fandom. It's worth noting at the time he was quite open about using the name Andy. I get the impression information about him changing the name was not widely spread at this time, so he was mostly able to fly under the radar. His time in the fandom began by responding to a challenge set by the fan podcast, The Quidditch Pitch. For this challenge, he wrote a one-shot piece of fan fiction titled Dumbledore's Army Still Recruiting and it seemingly went over pretty well with its readers. As such, Andy decided to expand it to a 256,000 word story entitled Dumbledore's Army and the Year of Darkness, which I will now refer to as Dade, for simplicity's sake. I did find a copy of this online, and I thought about reading it for research purposes, but then I decided that I love myself too much for that. There wasn't really a good reason to read it in full besides morbid curiosity. To give a brief rundown of what it's about, it's set during the events of Book 7 when Neville is leading his own version of Dumbledore's army and rebelling against the abusive and fascistic staff who have taken over Hogwarts. Abby has stated that the alternate universe with the teen soldiers Andy was channeling towards the end of her time with him are definitely the inspiration for this. There's apparently a lot of parallels between all that nonsense and what happens in the fic. Again, it was quite popular. I read a bit of it. I didn't read all of it, I just read a few pages, and it it was well written. It wasn't groundbreaking, but it was it was all right. The story soon got two sequels, one titled Sluog and another one titled A Pekitis. I don't know what happened in either of these, but Andy has claimed, and as such take that with a grain of salt, that Sluog is so disgusting and gross, it led to several reviewers on fanfic.net claiming it made them feel physically sick to read. And I think that is a pretty good segue into something else that becomes incredibly clear about Andy, something which wasn't so evident before this point. Intense misogyny. This fandom is infested with girls, little bubble-headed shipper chibis who blank all over me because I write from the perspective of a guy. As a guy, I've been told that my guys are blunt, aggressive, hot-tempered, that my fics are unnecessarily violent, that my guys aren't sensitive enough about their feelings and the feelings of the girls they deal with. Um, well, I hate to break it to you, Hannah Montana, but guys are like that, and moreover, war is like that. We do not speak the same language you do. Yeah, that piece sure had that opinion. Around this time he was also demonstrating a hatred for Slash, which is a bit odd as he did have a history of writing Slash, but okay. It's great to see somewhere that a heterosexual guy can be a heterosexual guy 
in this fandom without tiptoeing around all the fangirls and slashers trying not to offend anyone when he doesn't want Harry whipping into his chocolate ice cream to evanescence because Draco hasn't bent him over the table in the Great Hall lately, or because you're right that Seamus has had those kinds of fantasies about the Patil twins, and so has any other red-blooded 17-year-old boy. That last quote was posted to the um, Dark Lord Potter forum, incidentally, and there's no important reason why you need to know that. It's just, wow, <laughs> what a name. His arrogance and compulsive lying is also well on display at this point. There were a lot of overlapping and contradicting claims he was making on different fan sites and forums and things, but despite this, he was developing a fan base. With his developing fan base, he began to implement the strategy he used before. With people looking up to him as a very talented writer, he decided to host a two-week writing seminar online. As a part of this, he informed the participants not to eat for three days and to only drink water. What do you do if you want to brainwash someone? You tire them out in one way or another. You break down their barriers so the person will be more susceptible to whatever nonsense you present to them. This is very similar to what he did with Abby, where he tried to keep her up for very late at night, and then would later take her on really long hikes to tire her out. There are multiple examples of him doing this, and I believe this is calculated. He knew he could manipulate people if they were hungry and tired. Andy would eventually create a live journal community specifically focused on Dade. Yes, it was in fact popular enough to warrant an entire LJ community unto itself. It also has its own AO3 tag, but there's not a lot on there at the moment. With a community he himself was moderating, with very little connection to the rest of the fandom, Andy was able to get really gross. So there's a Google Doc you can find quite easily online with a timeline of all of Andy's activities and posts and things. It was extremely useful in researching this video. I am just going to quote verbatim from it to show you what I mean when I say gross. I will not link to it or give a specific date, but at one point on the community, in the midst of a lot of Dade audiobook casting posts, Andy asks 14 through 28 year old Dadians to post their pictures. He then tells each of them how much they look like this or that Dade character and tells some of the women that they are hot. So we're just going to move on. I don't need to dwell on this. I don't think I need to comment on that. It speaks for itself. Andy would soon begin assigning specific titles to certain followers, things like first lieutenant or chief house lieutenant, very much sticking to the military theme of his fan fiction, I imagine. And then he began to introduce channeling. Once again, very slowly. He would tell people to speak to characters through him, of course. He'd eventually talk about how real these characters were to him, and how when a character suffered, he'd physically feel it. All this nonsense. Yes, I know it's mental. Have I ever said I'm otherwise? Kind of explains the intimate relationship I have with them, and why the most common refrain from readers is that they are eerily, unnaturally real. They are real to me, whatever that says about my sanity. Honestly, I've sometimes wondered if I'm hooking into past lives or ghosts on some psychic plane, and my conscious brain can only interpret it by plugging into a pre-existing matrix of a fantasy world. So again, kind of doing the breadcrumbs, dropping hints here and there, claiming that spirits are on the astral plane that he's channeling through fan fiction, all that nonsense. History is repeating itself, essentially, and it would begin to do so in other ways as well. Andy would soon claim that he had a terminal heart condition and that he maybe didn't have a lot of time to live. Playing that up for pity points, he attempted more than once to have his fans pay for trips to go out and visit them. Some of these plans were successful, some of them were not. In any case, he began visiting his followers in person and presumably, I imagine, probably channeled his characters for them then as well. But not every trip went according to plan. Sometimes he would just claim that something came up or that plans fell through and then he would just keep the money that was raised. And then, because I guess he just couldn't help himself, and he decided that his fan base was big enough to warrant another convention. Yes, really. So the idea was batted around ages ago on my LJ, but the Dadeverse fandom was way smaller then, and I'm tossing it out again now that it's increased so much. Anyone interested in the idea of a Dadeverse minicon? Just copy-pasting from the old entries. The Dadeverse has picked up a surprisingly large and devoted following, and I was thinking that it might be fun to have something of a minicon where we could talk to other people who have gotten deep with this little corner of the Harry Potter fandom and exchange our creativity and learn from one another. If at least five people want to do this, I'll set up a dedicated post where people can sort out ride sharing, roommates, finding hostels, etc. It's four months away, and so with that in mind, he began to fundraise money for this. I also want to take note of the fact that he specifically told his fans not to share information about how old they were when they were registering for the convention. 
because otherwise he may have to ban them from certain events. Again, I am not going to get into the implications of that. I am just informing you of what he said. In addition to this, around the time he began planning this convention, he made an appearance on a separate Harry Potter podcast. There were so many of these, I swear to God. The name of the podcast was Podfic Weekly. You can find this episode quite easily, in fact. I did listen to a bit of it for research purposes. I didn't get all the way through it. I want to point out a few things of note. So throughout all of his time in the Harry Potter fandom up to this point, Andy was claiming that he was Irish and that his family had fought on both sides of the Irish Troubles. To make sure that this lie wasn't revealed, he spends the entire podcast episode putting on this insane fake Irish accent. You have to hear this. It's it's insane. It's not the big damn thing. That's the tip of the iceberg that is the big damn thing. At this point, we have now crossed 250 stories, of which over 100 of them I've written. We're on our third novel. Uh, there's videos. There's over 200 pieces of artwork. That's, I guess, where Keza got obsessed with the buff young men. It, it's mad now. In addition to this, during the episode, he also claims that he looks exactly like Harry Potter. He has a lightning scar just like the character, and that's why he didn't get into it for a long time, because people kept saying he looked like Harry Potter. And so I read through it. I had been kind of meaning to and kind of avoiding it, because I actually... I'm about 5'8", kind of skinny. Okay, really skinny. With messy black hair, glasses, and a... <laughs> Honest to God, lightning shaped scar in the center of my forehead. I've been getting shit, okay? I've been getting shit for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and the hosts just don't know what to say to that. They just swallow it. They're just like, oh, wow. <laughs> I really don't know what else to say about that. Andy has a history of compulsively lying from a very young age, from before he even got involved in any fandom period. And it's funny because there are a lot of lies he was telling at this period, which I'm not currently getting into because of time constraints and to make sure the video is not super scattered, but there's a lot of them and they all really contradict each other. But I guess because they were so spread out across so many different sites and forums and things, people just generally didn't catch on. But that doesn't mean his activities were going entirely unnoticed. Because Abby had stumbled onto the fanfiction DeviantArt, and she noticed the art style was very similar to that of her abusers. She did a bit of digging and quickly put two and two together and realized that Andy was doing the exact same thing he had done to her. Unsure of what to do about this, Abby decided to send an anonymous tip to Turamel. Obviously at this point they weren't really friends, but I think Abby knew that People listened to Turamel before, so with any luck, they would do so again. Turamel did post about Andy and spread the word about how the tent person was at it again. Her posts from this time were, again, very transphobic, which is one reason why I'm not getting into them. The other reason, though, is that it doesn't seem like anyone actually listened. It didn't help. The community weathered what I can only assume was a lot of hate and scrutiny from the rest of the fandom, and perhaps in a weird way that actually helped. An us versus them narrative can be really helpful if you're a cult leader. Telling followers that the outside world is against you is a great way for them to cling on to you as the one truth, you know, that kind of thing. Andy also had some pretty insane excuses and explanations for all of this, including claiming that the person responsible for things like Tent Moot was his evil twin. Wow. In any case, DadeCon was funded and organized and people did in fact attend. So personally speaking, this get together or mini convention or whatever we're gonna call it sounds terrible. Call it a convention is probably a bit misleading. There weren't that many people who attended and the events were things like watching Andy draw, listening to him read from the story, and not much else besides that, besides just kind of generally hanging out with one another. I can imagine for those who were like embedded in this community, it was fun to meet one another in person though. So I'm sure that those who participated had a nice time. One thing of note did occur at this convention though, and that is that Andy began to hang out in person with one particular fan, Brittany. Andy, Brittany, and a few others would hang out for a few days in New York after the convention ended, you know, just chillin'. His relationship with Brittany would continue to grow in the following months. I don't have a good transition for this, but about a week after DadeCon, something which is now known as the Undead Wizard Shaman Battle took place. I tried really hard to understand what was happening here. I'm so sorry, I can't give you more context. To the best of my comprehension, Brittany and Andy began claiming that another Dade cult member who was not online at the time was under attack and that Andy was unable to protect him on like the psychic plane or whatever because his shields were down 
as he was so weakened from the convention. And I guess he was asking his followers to like give psychic energy to support this person or something. I really don't know what happened here. It's just nonsense. But I think it does demonstrate how in a relatively short period, many people had once again gotten sucked into his religious machinations. And isn't that sort of frightening? He was able to find people who were open to this sort of thing and was able to build yet another cult. In less than a year, I hasten to add. The fact that it was centered on Harry Potter fanfiction makes that worse in my mind. He was able to get people involved in something that on the surface sounds so insane that nobody would actually be able to believe it. And I don't think that reflects poorly on his followers per se. I think it shows how good Andy was at this sort of thing. It's not funny, it's scary. And speaking of scary, Andy eventually flew out to visit Brittany in Sacramento. It was just going to be a short visit, but it eventually turned into a much longer one. During this trip, they also decided to hike all the way up to Vancouver, Canada. This was a long hike, and Andy channeled his date characters during it for Brittany. Again, I want to speculate that he probably tired Brittany out quite a bit on these hikes, making her more open to this kind of thing. Soon after that, he moved in with her, some other date fans, and her soon-to-be ex-husband. Not long after he moved in with them, Brittany would post to Facebook all of a sudden, accusing her father of a history of abuse. It's eerily like what Andy brainwashed Abby into believing back when she was living with him. Time passes and Brittany's ex-husband stops living with the group. I'm a little unclear on exactly what happened there, but unlike with Abby and her husband, I don't think that Andy's involvement in things really did much to end that marriage. It seems like it was already pretty strained, but the truth is what happened next makes the details of that irrelevant. So there was shit, there was stuff I discovered in researching this that I just wasn't comfortable talking about as I wasn't sure how to do so delicately. Stuff where I'm not sure if it's my place to disclose it. But what happens next is one of several things Andy's done that makes me feel just plain physically sick. But I, I, I can't ignore this. We. We have to talk about it. On May 9th, 2011, CBS Bay Area reported the following. A shooting at a home over the weekend that left three people dead, including the gunman, stemmed from a financial dispute between one of the victims and her estranged husband, according to police. Police identified the shooter as Jason Elsenberg, 27, and the victims as Anthony Chambers, 41, and Brittany Quinn, 27. Elsenberg lived at a home with Chambers, Quinn, and a 27-year-old man, according to police spokesman Officer Cleo Mayarl. Police believe Elsenberg shot Chambers and Quinn, then shot the 27-year-old man in the foot before shooting himself in the head. Andy was the 27-year-old man mentioned in the article. Brittany Quinn and Anthony Chambers were the cult members he was living with. I really don't want to dwell too much on this. Andy was not responsible for either of their deaths, and generally speaking, I'd not bring this up, but what Andy did in response to this is important. Andy would post a eulogy honoring Brittany, calling her one of the fallen, the name given to members of Dumbledore's army who have died in his story. No, I'm not kidding. He went ahead and connected this horrific and senseless tragedy to his Harry Potter fan fiction. And he did this more than once in the years following this. He also, in that initial post, spoke about how Brittany was super outdoorsy and that he wanted to organize a hike in her memory. So, bit of context. Before all of this, Andy was organizing another long hike with Brittany, in fact, and another date member in addition to her. This hike was going to take place in New Zealand, and they'd been raising money to make it happen. But now, with this tragedy, it became a hike to commemorate her memory and to raise money for a domestic abuse charity. Andy would leave that house and would move in with two different cult members, E and K. E and K would be the new people he'd be doing this hike with. There are a lot of posts from this point which are just plain icky. And really, I I really don't want to gloss over this. The way Andy spoke about Brittany after this tragedy just makes me feel sick. He would post about how she was a dear friend for years afterwards on the anniversary of her death, and that's not true. Brittany wasn't his friend. Brittany was his victim. Maybe not of the crime that took her life, but a victim nonetheless. Andy's time with E and K, these new members, followed his usual pattern. He didn't keep a job of any sort during any point he was living with them. He constantly lied to them. I'm sure there were a lot of others he channeled to justify plenty of absurd and terrible things. Planning continued, there was a change of location for the hike. Plan was to now follow the Trail of Tears. Presumably this would be easier than flying out to another country. It was organized, and three of them left to begin their trek. And it was... horrible. Andy would often force them to hike through the night, 
and the three of them were forced to share a small tent on the nights when they didn't. They did not have enough food for the journey, and Andy insisted on them hiking 20 miles a day over what I can imagine was not always easy terrain, at the hottest point in the summer. I can't say for certain if he planned it in such a way that there wouldn't be enough food or not. On the one hand, every project Andy has ever handled has been poorly organized and poorly thought out. On the other, he also has a history of manipulating and abusing his followers to make them vulnerable. So it could be one or the other. And he was manipulating and lying to them throughout the two months they were on this hike. All sorts of manipulations, attempts to try and play with their emotions, and of course, he channeled through all of it. He would also lie about feeling sick if he wanted to take breaks, because of course it only mattered if he was tired. It didn't matter to him if E and K were exhausted or in pain, and they were in fact overexerting themselves. One of them ended up seriously damaging their feet due to the excess amount of walking on this trip. Andy refused to stop to get medical help for ages. He did, however, don't worry, channel a healer to provide some support at one point, because of course he fucking did. By the end of the hike, E had lost 60 pounds over the course of two months and Kay, for their part, has sustained seemingly permanent injuries from this trip. The two have remained together as a couple, and I believe soon after this hike ended, they left Andy's group. Can't imagine why. The day the live journal community continued for a while after this, but over time, Andy started posting less and less in there. It seems like he just sort of lost interest and it eventually went dormant. Maybe people were leaving. Maybe interest waned after the second Deathly Hollows movie came out. Or maybe he noticed that LiveJournal was slowly dying, and Tumblr was slowly beginning to take its place as the main hub for fandom types. Maybe it's a bit of all those things. He did eventually join Tumblr. On Tumblr, he made a lot of terrible self-aggrandizing and problematic posts that I don't have time to get into. And that was it. He didn't do much else for a while. He did get involved in the Supernatural fandom and even began organizing a LARP that thankfully did not happen because people spread the word around warning everyone about who this person was and thankfully this time they did listen. I've also read that he tried to get involved in the Critical Role fandom but again people alerted the fandom to who he was and he was unsuccessful. I do wonder with how decentralized Tumblr is with its dashboard and hashtags and the like, if it may have been a bit more difficult for him to build a community in a way that he needed. LiveJournal had features that let you create private communities, which meant that a lot of weird stuff could go on without anyone noticing. I can imagine the lack of any way to seclude or isolate people made building another cult difficult for Andy. Nowadays, Andy lives in LA and is supposedly designing costumes for movies, and as far as I know, he's mostly kept to himself the past few years, but I worry that won't last. I wouldn't be surprised if one day someone making very similar claims makes an appearance in one fandom or another. All we can do is hope that that doesn't happen and keep an eye out just to be safe. So there you have it. The Crimes of Andy Blake. This isn't even a comprehensive overview. There was a lot I had to leave out and some of it was really bad. If any of his victims are watching, I hope you are healing, I hope you are in a better and happier place now, and I hope that you are able to find peace. I'm not sure what else to say here. If there's any good that can come from this video, it'll be helping make sure he won't ever make a comeback. I'd normally do some sort of call to action now, but it feels a little inappropriate, so we're done. If you stick around, I can assure you the next video is going to be a lot lighter than this, a lot more fun than this. I'm David M, and I'll be seeing you soon.